Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce the principal investigators of the Pervade Project, um, which they'll tell you about. Uh, rather than introduce the whole group, I'm going to introduce our own uh, Dr. Matt Beats, Assistant Research Professor here in the Department of Informatics. So those of you who are local um, know Matt very well. He wears a lot of hats around here. So his research focuses on the design of socio-technical systems for data sharing and distributed collaborative knowledge work. Uh, he's published recently in the Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education, Computer Supported Cooperative Work, in the Journal of the American Medical Informatics Association. Um, I could go on, but uh, instead, uh, I'll just say that in addition to this research, he does a lot of teaching here in the department, um, classes in social analysis of computerization, organizational information systems, and computer-supported cooperative work. Um, and then I just learned today, while scouring the internet for things to introduce mm -hmm. Matt with, that he has a dark past as a musician, a degree <laughs> in cello performance. Maybe we can talk about that downstairs after the talk. So um, let's welcome our own Matt Beats. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Today's a little bit different than usual um, in that we're doing a panel. And the, the sort of um, occasion for this is that um, we got a grant to, uh, that began last fall to, call, to study pervasive data ethics. And so this is our first PI meeting in person that we're having here at Irvine. And so we wanted to talk with you a little bit about the kind of work we're doing. And so I'm going to introduce um, my fellow uh, principal investigators. So first, Katie Shilton, who's at the University of Maryland. Casey Fiesler, who is at uh, University of Colorado Boulder. Jake Metcalf, who's at the Data and Society Institute. Um, Jessica Vitak, who's also at University of Maryland. And Michael Zimmer, who's at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. <clears throat> and we've all sort of are taking on a little bit. The, the process that we're going to do today is we're going to start off, um, take about half of the time to do a series of provocations of the things that interest each of us and sort of how they relate. Um, and then we're going to open it up. And we've got a few kind of feed questions that we could discuss if we want to. But we're hoping, actually, that you will ask us questions and that we can have a real discussion about some of the things that we're interested in. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Katie, who's going to introduce the project. Yeah. So um, we have a tongue-in-cheek graphical depiction of the Data Justice League, which is what we've been calling ourselves <laughs> because uh, we're comic book nerds. But uh, this is the team, and we should also acknowledge uh, we have one PI who couldn't be with us today, Arvind Narayan, and he's at Princeton as well, and he's a picture up there to the flash. All right, so pervasive data is our uh, not perfect term uh, for this phenomenon that we're interested in, uh, which is challenging uh, research ethics and the, the sort of hows and whys of, of uh, how many people do research about people. Um, and so we are calling this rich, deep, and often identifiable data about people. So we're particularly interested in data about people, um, and particularly data that is available for computational research. So uh, processable in some way, some way that makes it um, accessible. So often, I mean, this is what gets called big data a lot. Um, we didn't really want to use big because then everybody asks you what you mean by big. So we said, well, people can ask us what we mean by pervasive. Um, <laughs> it's maybe slightly better. And um, a lot of this, so our interest in this uh, is happening in the shadow of um, a few ethics controversies that have come up in um, broadly our community, which you might call social computing or informatics or information studies. Um, and XKCD has a nice example of the Facebook uh, study controversy, which you might remember from about four years ago, um, where uh, uh, Facebook was doing research on, on users. Um, and it became very controversial, uh, controversial because it was academic research on users um, without explicit consent. Uh, and it raised this question about when you need to get consent to do research using people's online data, um, what is public data, what is um, uh, appropriate when you're talking at a scale of thousands or millions of people. Um, and uh, we decided that uh, we wanted to try and answer some of those questions. And at least for me, and I think for many of us, this came out of uh, the fact that we were struggling with these questions ourselves. Uh, so in our own research, we were not sure if it was OK to analyze Slack channels right, without getting everyone's permission uh, in the group. Uh, we weren't sure. We had a grad student who was not sure about the ethics of violating terms of service. Um, and so uh, Jessica Fikatak and I, because we had this grad student who uh, was really worried about these questions, we did a survey of uh, social computing researchers and found that 
uh, there's a lot of divergence um, and not a lot of agreement around what is an appropriate uh, norm or guideline for conducting research with online data. Um, we have these new ways of collecting the data. That's not uh, a problem. But we don't agree as a community about the feasibility and necessity of getting consent. We don't agree about whether it's OK to ignore terms of service put in place by platforms. We don't agree about whether um, deception is OK in, a, in an online research where it's very hard to debrief people afterwards about the deception that you've used. Um, we don't agree about um, uh, all of these things. And it turns out that users of these platforms have really complex reactions to people doing research uh, on these platforms. That they, and those reactions seem to turn on a whole variety of factors. Um, and so we started to ask, well, could we, could we figure out what some of those factors are? Can we figure out um, what makes uh, people feel more OK or less OK about this kind of research? Um, and finally, we have a regulation system, university IRBs in the US, uh, similar um, institutional bodies overseas that have a lot of experiential wisdom um, about uh, regulating research, be people who have made careers out of doing this, but uh, very little technical training. And all of a sudden, they're being asked to deal with um, unpredictable algorithms and uh, large sets of data. Um, and also, I have to say, a history of problems regulating social research. Um, there's, a, there's a long history of controversy um, about what is acceptable in social research and how and, how and whether university IRB should be regulating it. So that gave us our set of goals. Um, so this was our first meeting to set out uh, we are working on creating <coughs> metrics for assessing and modeling risk to online subjects to see if we can actually measure and model uh, and understand risks. Uh, modeling user concerns to make them accessible to researchers. If we can understand the factors that uh, particularly concern users or the particular kinds of research that concerns users, we can hopefully provide some of that back to researchers. Um, adapting existing codes for pervasive data. Research ethics has a long history. Um, uh, we were just talking about that a lot of this research reminds us of some of the controversies that have happened in ethnographic research, which is all about observation of people. Um, so can we adapt some of those existing codes for this new, uh, new series of methods and new scale of method? Um, understanding the impact of both academic and industrial regulators. So there are now uh, companies are starting to put regulation into place and uh, research ethics re regulation. Can we understand some of that impact? <coughs> and finally, can we find a, can we help disseminate evidence-based best practices for doing this kind of research? Once we start to come to community agreements on what is not is or is not acceptable, uh, can we help get the word out there? So that's the goal of this project. And uh, I'm going to turn this over to provocations. Thanks. So I'm going to start us off, like I said, we've got kind of a set of five provocations. These are short little ideas. This is not a sort of, it's not everything that's out there, but it's some things we've been thinking about. Um, if you're wondering, we did choose the boring way to decide what order these are going in. Um, so I'm starting on beats, but luckily that also correlates. They will get more interesting and turn out. So, you know, we have this perfect correlation between interestingness and how late your name is in the alphabet. So it works out well. So what I want to talk about, um, and I just want to throw this up. Does anyone know what this is? A map. What does it look like? Where do you think this is? It's Los Angeles. That's Los Angeles. So this is data that's a few years old, um, I almost, I think 2013 or 2014. But actually, the trend is about the same. So it turns out that each of those dots represents tweets, huh. geolocated tweets. It also turns out, anyone do you want to guess what the color is for? Politics. Sorry? Politics. <laughs> <laughs> Android versus iOS. Red is iOS, green is Android. And if you know anything about LA, there's a pretty strong socioeconomic segregation of that technology within that city. And this is kind of one of the things I'm interested in thinking about are issues of vulnerable populations and inclusion and exclusion in this data. Where are the biases and how are we thinking about this? Research has kind of a history of, or there's a long history in research of 
putting the burdens of research onto especially uh, minority or other populations, onto certain populations. Think about things like the Tuskegee experiments or other things like that. We also know that um, often we leave people out of research who should be in research. So there's uh, both kind of a putting the wrong people in for the wrong reasons, but also leaving people out accidentally. And we've done thought about that and addressed that mostly as a demographic issue um, in a lot of our, our thinking about the ethical aspects of that. And one of the things I'm, I argue is that we need a more socio-technical understanding of that, where now it's not just those demographic patterns of, of say, age or gender or, um, or um, uh, income, those kinds of things, but we also think about where are the sensors actually picking up data about people. There's a, a author named Jonas Lerman who said that billions of people remain on the margins of big data. <clears throat> and thinking about there are people who we aren't able to see with these techniques that we're accidentally leaving out. We also know that the design of certain technologies actually means you can't study um, certain populations even if you want to with them. For example, there's a lot of work, I've been working with people in public health, there are a lot of people studying obesity using smart scales. But it turns out most smart, every commercial smart scale on the market has a weight capacity below 350 pounds. Which means we're actually for a technical reason cutting out the obese from our studies of obesity. And so there are interesting new ways to think about this that have to do with a more of a socio-technical perspective. So that's, I think, my provocation, and I will turn it over to now Casey. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so again, I'm Casey uh, from the University of Colorado, and I'm going to talk about two uh, related exploratory uh, projects that I've already done that lead to a similar kind of provocation. Um, so I'm the buzzkill lawyer in the room, um, and I have been for a while. So for example, when I was getting my PhD and our lab wanted to study yik yak data, I read the terms of service, said, oh, we can't do that. Um, and then my PhD advisor wrote a blog post and everyone started freaking out about terms of service. <laughs> um, so I've done an analysis of data collection provisions in terms of service. They all look pretty similar <laughs> in the end. They're also way more common than you think you might be. Out of a set of about 120 social media sites that we looked at, something like eight, between 80 and 90 had some kind of exclusion on some kind of data collection. Most of them look like this. We prohibit crawling, scraping, caching, otherwise you know, a big string of legalese. Um, but what's missing is any kind of context, most of the time. It doesn't matter why you're collecting the data, it doesn't matter what kind of data you're collecting, it is an all or nothing kind of thing. And whereas the law or a policy cares nothing about context, an ethical consideration should always care about context, right? Um, which brings me to another project that I've done, which is looking at how Twitter users actually feel about researchers using their tweets. Um, this is a pretty exploratory survey that I did a couple of years ago. Um, some of the basic takeaways are that, A, they have no idea, for the most part, that this is a thing that can happen. Um, in fact, a fair percentage of them thought that it is against Twitter's terms of service for someone to do something like that, whereas actually, if you go look at their privacy policy, it explicitly says, oh, well, by the way, university researchers might be looking at your tweets. <laughs> um, and we asked a lot of contextual questions. I, I wasn't interested in saying, oh, it's ethical or it's unethical to use tweets. What I really want to understand is, is the context around what makes people feel differently about it. Um, and it actually wasn't like, oh, we want to be asked for consent. Instead it was, I really wish I'd known about this. If my tweet is in a research paper somewhere, that's fascinating. 85% of our participants said that they wanted to read the paper if they knew about it. Um, and the other thing is that different types of context matter. So things like how the data is being analyzed, like people feel differently if it's eyes on qualitative work versus, oh, my tweet is one of a million um, in a data set. And uh, the type of research, the type of researchers. Some people have felt better about marketers than they do about us liberal academics who are going to twist their words. <laughs> um, and so the takeaway from this is that the decisions about responsible data collection shouldn't be made without context. So we shouldn't be making decisions that are, can I collect this data? 
if it says, if the terms of service say I can't, then I can't, if the terms of service say I can, then I can, because then you're not taking into account any of the kind of context that matters about whether you're doing actual harm. Um, which is also why my answer about breaking terms of service tends to be that even if it's against it, you should be considering the context because there are reasons why it might be ethical too. So that's what, I, and so now I'm going down these paths uh, in more detail now. Now I will turn it over to you. Jake. <coughs> Oops. Hi, Nick Metcalf. Uh, I'm a researcher at the Data and Society Research Institute, which is a uh, <coughs> independent think tank in uh, New York, um, although I'm based in California. I am interested in how the norms and conceptual frameworks and practices of research ethics um, are being adapted to or not adapted to um, the uh, new research methods in uh, data analytics, especially around machine learning. So uh, the ways that we think about uh, proper research methods um, from an ethical perspective were have a history. Um, they're not simply just deliberated on, but rather they're, off, they're in response to certain kinds of scandals. Um, they happen in a specific historical period, and they make certain assumptions about what scientific research looks like um, and what human subjects care about. It turns out that a lot of those rules and norms and conceptual frameworks um, are mismatched significantly with some of the methods of um, data analytics. Um, so one of the ways that I think about this is um, how have we changed what it means to be a human subject in um, data science? So um, it might seem obvious, right? Human subjects research is any research about humans. Turns out that's not the case. <laughs> um, human subjects research is actually a very narrowly defined idea inside of the regulations that the U.S. government uses to um, mm -hmm. do ethics regulations on federally funded research. So there's, um, uh, it, it's built specifically to handle the kinds of dilemmas that um, uh, physician researchers and um, psychologists doing deceptive research um, run into. So um, and it, it turns out that the way that we've defined what it means to be a human inside of a research project um, and what it is that they care about and what it is that can harm them essentially makes all of the possible risks of data science research invisible. So um, in a traditional model, informational risk is delimited. That is, um, once, the once the data exists, um, then all of the harm is already done. But in data science, informational risk is extensive. That is, um, as the data gets repurposed, um, as it gets stored, um, as it is sort of indefinitely reused for God knows how many projects, the risk spills over in time in a way that it just doesn't in traditional models. Um, in traditional human subjects, we worry about harm done to individuals within the research methods. Um, but with data science, harms are distributed. They happen across a community or across a globe. Um, uh, and instead of being individual, they're collective. Sometimes. Um, and it turns out that actually in the ethics regulations uh, that, that guide research in the US, um, uh, they're primarily in concerned with interventional harms rather than informational harms. There are, there, there are privacy protections, but it's mostly about what happens if you draw blood rather than what happens if someone learns something negative about you in 20 years. Um, and so there's, uh, there's a number of ways that the the sort of epistemologies of data science are mismatched with the tools and the concepts that we've built to handle um, ethical research. And so um, I'm in, in the Pervade project, I'm tracking that through a number of paths where we're talking about um, uh, you know, how, are, how are data science researchers handling ethics questions when they can't actually rely on the tools um, and the infrastructures that we've built up to handle um, basically other disciplines. Um, and what is it we need to do um, in order to update our policies and our guidelines um, to make it actually easier for data scientists 
to do you know the most ethical research practices um, that you want to. Um, I'll pass it on to Joseph. So when Katie was doing the introduction, she mentioned uh, a study we did a couple of years ago in which we were gauging the attitudes and behaviors of social computing researchers. That was uh, the first in a series of studies. After we did that, we decided we wanted to get a sense of how IRBs felt, because they are another of the major players in this process. So I'm going to talk briefly about that, because that is one of the big groups we're also interested in in this project. So one of the questions is, do IRBs actually think they can handle all of these requests, uh, all of these projects that are, they are now having to deal with for data projects, for data scraping, for websites uh, and machine learning techniques and all these other things where they don't have necessarily background, they don't have that expertise, that existing knowledge <coughs> to gauge the risk uh, to potential, the potential risk to participants. So we went and uh, identified using the Carnegie classification all the research universities in the US, compiled a list of emails, reached out to them to complete a survey. Basically very similar to the social computing researcher uh, survey. Uh, I will say Irvine gave us the most interesting response. <laughs> they reached out to me, they said, I'm sorry, we can't complete your survey without you completing an IRB application. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. I was like, I have IRB approval from Maryland. I want you to participate in my study. And they're like, we know. <laughs> you need to complete an IRB application. For I was like, no, no. So I was like, it's all right. You don't need to participate. <laughs> Uh, so we ended up getting uh, about 60 some IRBs to participate and we had a paper published last year in, I'm never going to remember the name of this, Journal of Empirical <laughs> Research on Human, human Research Ethics. Human Subject Research Ethics. Yeah. yeah. I don't think it's human subject research, isn't it? It's just human research ethics. It's, like yeah, it's just human research ethics. J-E-R-H-R-E. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to very briefly summarize the three main takeaways. The first is this idea that Katie, again, she echoed. So it's very similar to what social computing researchers say. There's this lack of consensus among IRBs. If you've worked in multiple institutions, you probably already know this, about what constitutes big data, what needs to be reviewed, what should be exempt versus expedited uh, when it comes to review. So there is no kind of standard consensus uh, amongst IRBs around the US about this. I think this is a problem. Um, they want and need researchers at these institutions to help educate them. They want researchers to come to them when they're unsure and talk to them and teach them about the different sites, the different tools, the ways in which they are doing their research because they're not just going to magically learn these things. So they need the experts who are at these universities to work with them more actively. Um, they, haven't, they don't have clear ways of facilitating this. They don't have a clear idea of how to do that. Uh, and kind of the weird, the weird third takeaway was that many of them said, like, we are confident in our ability to assess applications and determine whether there is risk. However, they were also very clear in saying we do not have the technical expertise on our staff needed to uh, understand technical, really technical applications. But we're still confident. And so there, there is this conflicting opinion in that we have all of this institutional knowledge and we're going to rely on that to guide our decisions even if we don't have a lot of the technical knowledge. And that's probably why there's this lack of consensus, why there are a lot of times confusion and disagreement and disgruntlement, I think, from researchers when it seems like the IRBs just don't get what the research is. So I think there's lots of opportunities going forward. We have a lot of ideas of working with IRBs, going to the Primer Conference, which is the big IRB group, um, and trying to bridge that gap between IRBs and researchers. I'm going to pass it to Michael, who's going to wrap up for us. Okay. Thank you. I'm just going to see if there's a marker. Oh, there's not a marker. Okay, well, right. Um, I'm Michael Zimmer. Thanks for letting me come to California for a few days. Escape, <laughs> uh, escape Milwaukee. Um, a lot of what we've heard about 
um, already are questions about bias, questions about whether or not it's okay to follow or break through. Oh, it's, I'll, I'll be okay. Oh, is it? Okay. Hey, thank you, though. thank you. Um, whether it's okay to break rules or not, um, whether or not um, we have uh, the right conceptualization of concepts, when we have consent, can our RVs able to, to deal with things? And this all motivates my approach to this topic to really try to understand when we have these kind of breakages in our conceptual understanding of the things that motivate research ethics. And it's one of the really interesting challenges that pervasive data brings to us is that it's challenging the way that we approach things like consent or the concept of privacy itself or how we conceptualize what's public data versus non-public data. And my primary goal in life is to, to shatter all these conceptualizations because I think we need to rethink our approach to dealing with this. And the one case um, that comes to mind when I think about this is something that you might be familiar with uh, on an OKCupid uh, data release. Um, is anyone familiar with this case? It's from about maybe a year and a half ago, um, where a, uh, a graduate student in Denmark uh, was doing some research and decided he wanted to research OKCupid profiles. OKCupid is a dating website. Uh, where users create a profile and they answer a whole bunch of questions. And it's all these really intimate and non-intimate, but lots of really unique questions that help us match up people. Um, and he wanted to do that, so he created an account on OkCupid and grabbed a bunch of data, uh, wrote a paper, and then released uh, the data. Um, and he was excited about this, and one of the first reactions was, oh, you didn't look like you, you didn't anonymize any of the data that you released. It included usernames, it included an email account that was attached. Uh, to that to that data set, and his response is a common response. No, the data is already public. And he actually uh, previewed that in the paper itself. He says, some might object to the ethics of gathering this information, but the data found in the data set are or were already publicly available. And we see this refrain often when we're doing with this kind of research using uh, pervasive data uh, within this field, that if the data is public, it's okay for me to use that. Um, whenever I, this sentence, the data is already public, appears anywhere, there's bells that automatically go off <laughs> in my head and then I, and I get to work. Um, and this is the concern that, that I bring to this, is that I think we need to rethink our conceptualizations of what, first of all, we mean by public. Um, too long in, in privacy discourse, we've been working around this dichotomy between public and private. Um, and, and one of my goals in life is to destroy that dichotomy um, and embrace, uh, like Casey was talking about, context. And the context is what's important here. Um, so if I have any provocation in terms of what I want to accomplish with this project is actually to remove privacy from the discussion altogether. Um, and it's a question of context and it's a question of respect um, and autonomy and other kinds of ethical frames that I think would help uh, drive research ethics in, in, a, in a more proper direction when we deal with this data. Um, and that's all I have, so I'm not sure what's next. Uh, so, that's it. Yeah. That's it. Excellent. So at this point, I mean, we have, we as a group are able to talk about this for days, and in fact, we have been. Um, but what we want to do is, is hopefully open this up and hear from you and see what kind of questions you have or thoughts or things you've been running into if you've got uh, questions or, or even anecdotes or things that you have, you've popped up with or dealt with in your research and to open it up to a discussion. So... Paul. Um, first, thank you. This is really, uh, the, the project you're doing is important and fabulous and fascinating. And I have like a billion different things to say, <laughs> but I'll try and restrain myself to one of them. And so there's this, um, a debate has like, you know, exploded on, you know, the, the paid Facebook page of a friend of mine lately who posted something. Um, she's in Europe, and she's concerned about the upcoming EU, the, the, G, uh, the oh, I always get the actual, the GDPR. 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 Um, and she's wondering what this means for ethnography. And so in the, and like, you know, well, like what, what happens here to data? And so I want to ask about the word data, because another reading of pervasive data is the pervasive notion that things are data. Because in HCI, ethnography is all about data, but if I go over to Anthro, nothing to do with data, it's about participation, it's about engagement, <coughs> all those other things. And the idea that what's formulated as the production of data that then is subject to mm -hmm. data concerns is, is actually sort of antithetical to the, to the idea. And so I'm wondering just how, what, what data is here as an object that we formulate as the focus of our concern? Um, and how that's, because part of this does seem to be a discussion about um, an expanding notion of data such that all, all forms of scholarship and inquiry get sort of data-fied, which seems like a, a, a problematic thing. Yeah, that's such a good question. 
Yeah, so I mean, there's a really interesting looping effect between how different disciplines think about data and ethics. So anthropologists for a long time have said we should not be under the common rule. We actually have, so the, sorry, the common rule is the name of the um, rule in the federal regulations that require federally funded research to use um, IRBs to do essentially an ethics review if that research involves humans. So um, anthropologists have long said we have a more rigorous ethical norm than the common rule ever permits. And in fact, participating in the common rule makes us do things that are contrary to the ethics of anthropology. <laughs> Um, because we're not, because uh, we, as soon as we make them sign a consent form, we've broken um, trust with them. Because we've formulated, we, we make a different kind of trust when we go do ethnography. Um, and so um, there's, uh, there's, that, there's sort of a long history of push and pull around what counts as research and what counts as ethical research um, that, that moves differently in different disciplines. Um, what, I think that the, what, when we say we want to focus on pervasive data, probably the problem we're most focused on is the repurposing of commercial data for the purpose of, of scientific research. So that seems to be the kind of issue that we move back to um, all the time is that there's, you know, there's a lot of data available for data scientists, but most of it's made in a commercial context. Um, and uh, that has very different issues around um, consent, uh, very different issues around trust and responsibility, um, because you're, essentially because you've switched contexts, right? So um, it, it becomes really hard to track what you're responsible for if you, um, when you jump context if you're not really, really careful about it. And, but, but there's no consensus on what careful means, though. I think the other thing, so I think you're absolutely right, that commercially uh, produce or produce in a context that is not research data that is then being used in research is a big concern. I also think one of the reasons we've, we've hung on to data is that that's a signifier of computationally available. Um, and that that is where some of this tension or torque is happening around uh, taking things that might be knowable about humans um, in a non-computational sense and trying to fit them in to uh, a, a big data logic, right? And, I, and, I, and that, that, that I think there's a sense in, that that seems to be what's, that, that is one of the things breaking our, our current set of frameworks, <laughs> which were already broken, as Jake points out. Um, but it's, it's putting so much tension on them that we need to figure out what it is that we can do to, um, to ease some of that or to, to, to and besides, you know, destroying data research. I don't think that that's any of our intent. It's not our intention, I'm going to say. Uh, but uh, trying to point to, to out to researchers that by trying to know things about people using thing, only things accessible to computers, um, you are, you're creating a, a, a troublesome situation that you then have to work to resolve. I think, I think too, building on that, this, this question that you're bringing up, Paul, is also <laughs> showing us that the way that we're framing the data that's being used in a particular project, and then I release that data, that, and I think I've cleaned that data, or I've scrubbed it, or I've done whatever I need to do to make it safe. That there are other, now, because of our ability to, to engage in computational work and, and that emerging in aggregation, there's other, there's other pieces of that data set that wasn't part of my data that I was using, but it's there, and now can expose some other linkage. There's this data, you know, um, a, a linkage that happens there, and it's a lot of the work that Arvind is doing is exposing some of these ways that data that I thought was okay and that I thought was good um, actually becomes becomes dangerous and pervasive in that, in that sense. And we, we use the term human subjects data for things like survey responses or interview transcripts or, or this kind of thing. Um, so one of the reasons that I think the word data is interesting is because something like tweets, like the people who are tweeting, they don't, they don't see it as data, it's content. And, and I think there are a lot of, especially, um, uh, researchers who are using who are using this data who aren't in a traditionally human centered field mm -hmm. and it's not they don't see it as having anything to do with humans it's just it's data um, and so one of the things we're looking at is how data created by humans like ha like there is some human in there it's not just you know temperature measurements or geological data um, that there's actually some it's not like just because it's public and because it's data that it can do no harm. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it absolutely seems that data yeah. is the term you have to use, and it signals the conversation that you want to convene, and, and, and so, yeah, uh, uh, but it's like, but, it, but I think the conversation becomes, is convened because the term is in flux, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and because different people have different parts of that, which I, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a bigger question, than, so, but those are really helpful, thank you. Yeah. So we had a speaker last quarter that was talking about pervasive monitoring. So being aware of like your file statistics, other things that you're doing, and you know there were even like forks that measured how many times you were chewing your food before swallowing, um, or how many bites you would take, right? Um, do you see, and, and with, with that talk there was more about like liberation, by being aware of these things, we're gaining new power um, and recognizing certain uh, patterns that we're taking place of, so not that we're losing control to a pervasive <coughs> but that we're getting new autonomy through it. Do you see similar trends in um, some of the data practices and some of the things that is occurring within this space as far as getting more power over research and having more voice for people? Yes. <laughs> um, so yeah. let me, let me I, I've been, because I've been working in the, also in specifically in health areas for a while now and thinking about some of these issues of um, this kind of data in health. <laughs> The other thing that we're thinking about with pervasive data is not just kind of social media, but also things that might come from devices, Internet of Things, all of these <coughs> new spaces that are generating large amounts of traces. Um, and I think that there is a, a sense in which this data, some of the ethics around the data as well play in, in, in interesting ways. Um, there's a group, um, called the Open APS, which is the Open Artificial Pancreas System. Um, and what they have done, um, they were, it's actually two projects, that project and another one called Project Night Scout. And these are um, working in the medical device field. Um, there are two different devices, one of which is a what's called a continuous glucose monitor. So by inserting a small probe under your skin, you can actually, rather than having to draw blood a couple times, a few times a day, you actually can get a continuous reading of the level of, of glucose in your blood. For, so for people with specifically type 1 diabetes. And we also have insulin pumps, which allow you to actually um, rather than having to give yourselves injections, will actually more slowly and regularly kind of give yourself and, um, and monitor or, and contribute to your insulin levels. These things would never talk to each other. And so a, a group has actually come forward that has actually hacked the continuous glucose monitors because the company would not release that research, da that data, to the people who were generating it. And so they've actually hacked it and have instructions available on how to get your data out of these devices. And another group has actually hacked them together with the insulin pumps to create essentially a hack together, do it yourself, artificial pancreas. And they're now on the order of somewhere between 10 and 20 people in the United States who are living day to day with an essentially a hack together DIY artificial pancreas that they've played with the openness and the availability of this kind of data to do that. So I think there's a lot of power there. But I think that the other, another aspect of that is that these are also, at the same time that you're doing it, we're, uh, for the most part, you know, that's 10 to 20 people, but think about the millions who are using Fitbits or whatever. That's data that's being controlled by a particular company. We don't know where it's going. It's not transparent about what's happening to that data. But in particular, well, I, you know, we may be interested in how many steps we take a day. A lot of times what um, that data is getting used for, inferences be far beyond mm -hmm. what that initial use of the data might be that have to do with things like, you know, if, especially if there's GPS or something attached to them, where are you when, what kind of activities are you engaging in, where have you moved, can all be co come out of that same data set. And so I think questions about what can be inferred from that data beyond that original purpose also become really important. I think we're at a really strange 
place with these devices right now in that a lot of people are finding them liberating until they hit the uncanny valley and they're like, holy crap, I can't believe what these devices know about me. And I think the whole Strava debacle was, uh, was one of those moments where suddenly everybody was using the device and they're like, yeah, I can track my fitness, I can be more fit, more aware of my body until, holy crap, we know where all these secret US uh, military bases are in the middle of the desert, in the Middle East. Oops, <laughs> like suddenly they're revealing all this additional information. Uh, Michael and I have another grant in which we're looking at uh, Fitbit devices, the Alexas and series. I mean, what we find is that people, I mean, we do, we study, we come from a privacy and surveillance approach. So we're, we're we don't think, I mean, people aren't finding them as liberating. No. They're not even. They're not. They're not even thinking about the data implications. Like it is just not on their radar at all. And yeah, if you bring it up, if you start to ask them questions about, it, like, oh, sharing this with different parties, like, yeah. it's just it's just nowhere. This this idea of who could have that data, and it's important because Fitbit has been used. Fitbit data has been used in court cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we've done a really good job of selling smart forks for the utility that they provide while obscuring what else might be happening in, in, in the background. So I'm always reminded of Neil Postman, who had studied on there briefly, and he, he was always asking, what is the problem that this technology is the solution for? And then whose problem is that, really? And it's often not the end users. Um, and, and that's always kind of motivated the way that we're thinking through <coughs> these, these challenges. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it might look liberating to self-surveil because you can't you can't fix what you don't know, right? And if and lots of problems you can't understand unless you can quantify. Um, but within our economy, but in our political economy, that is not a relationship only to yourself. It's a relationship to a company. It's a relationship to um, an information ecosystem that's controlled by certain market relationships and certain laws. Um, and um, when we frame it as liberating oneself, we don't, we, there has to be the other side of the coin, which is um, binding yourself to those relationships that are invisible and in which you do not have any power. The, the earliest days of the quantified self movement were liberating yeah, because they were pre-technology and right. the very first people in the quantified self movement were doing it all with like paper diaries yeah. and, and things like that. And there's some really cool like self-generated self visualizations where people would actually do all the work, but then the technology all started to emerge and yes, then I, now we're tying ourselves to the Fitbits and all these other companies. I think your question has pointed out something really interesting that we, we're going, we've talked about some already and are going to need to have a much broader community conversation about, which is how much of addressing the ethics of this research is about data literacy and particip increasing participation and making you know sure that people understand um, their own data and, and you know and then how much of it is about protecting people um, about uh, you know breaking the the relationship between uh, secret corporate data and and individual and, and, so, and I don't I, I that's, that's going to be a value judgment at some point right how much is about protection and how much is about participation um, and I, I don't know what, how the community is going to come down on that, right? That's going to have to be a bigger conversation. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The issue was raised a minute ago about uh, what do you mean by data? <laughs> Let me uh, uh, raise another word you use that uh, I, I don't quite understand, and that is you use the term ethics. <clears throat> it seems that that would be grist for uh, the mill of uh, interdiscipline activity. Ethics means uh, one thing in one time period and another uh, thing in another time period. It means a different thing to people who uh, study ethics uh, as a profession and be different things to lawyers. It means different things. You know, what has traditionally been ethical may not be ethical now and may not be ethical in the, in the uh, future that you can see. And uh, I, I don't understand how you you know, it, 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 it seems like this ought to be examined by interdisciplinary interdisciplinary uh, team. We are. We are. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we're, we're squarely within the tradition of um, applied research ethics. So um, we're, we're not, you know, we're not reading Augustine. We're not, um, 
trying to resolve for once and all, for forever, whether or not utilitarianism or deontology is the correct perspective, but rather we're, we're asking, um, you know, how does one account for and mitigate the um, consequences of scientific research for the people who are being studied? I mean, and, and, and right now, a, lo a lot of researchers have the conception of ethics that what the IRB says I cannot do is unethical, and what the IRB says I can do is ethical, uh, which also isn't, isn't the right way um, to think about it. And as Katie and Jessica pointed out, like, we have a, a distinct lack of norms within even just if you're just looking at social computing as a research community, there's no people disagree wildly on what is considered on what they think is ethical. Um, and so one of the things we were trying to bring to the conversation is some data, some empiricism that could help inform this community and then maybe other communities making decisions for themselves about what they think normatively should be should be considered ethical. One of the things we've talked about is that we need to uh, work with folks who are doing actually very similar work in bioethics, uh, which is not, so none of us come out of the bioethics space, right? And um, public health has another set of, uh, sort of ethical frameworks that they tend to apply. And so I think your point is well taken that uh, discipline to discipline, there are some, uh, some differences that are worth paying attention to. And, and there are groups like us uh, working in those spaces. And so one of the conversations we had with one of our advisory board members yesterday was, all right, how do we, how do we get all those people in the same room and have a conversation about like what are even our principles, right? Like what are the frameworks we want to apply? Um, because people are using the same methods across all of these disciplines now, which is really interesting. Um, but they're coming at it with uh, different histories and different uh, frameworks. And I, I, I appreciate that point. I mean, yeah. I, a colleague and I recently released a, a book we edited called Internet Research Ethics for the Social Age. But I really wanted to call it, there is no such thing as ethical research. Um, but the publisher didn't think that would sell. And it's this question about that, you know, it's not about having ethical research. It's something you can demark something as now this is ethical. You know, but how can we use ethics and all of its plurality, to your, to your point, to help inform our research practices? And that's kind of the way that I deal with that, that challenge that you, that you posed for us. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. I think one of the things, too, and just for a little context on, the, on our project, as we talked about when we, were, when we were first starting this up, kind of a sense we were getting that um, if you try to, that you can um, ask these questions from a more philosophical point of view, what's about ethic, you know, sort of base ethical considerations. And a lot of the conversations we would have with people is that we would get to a point where we'd say, but you know, they're developing norms and eventually you need to think about what are the community norms. Mm -hmm. yeah. But those are changing so much we aren't quite sure what they are. And that's kind of where we see this project contributing is a little bit to say, okay, so what are those developing norms? What are, what are the expectations that are happening? Where are those in line with what we've had for a while? Where are they changing in ways that may help uh, that we need to start rethinking and going back? And to you know maybe reconsidering what our uh, positions are, so, but yeah, I think that's a really valid point. Yeah, Aaron. Um, thanks for the wonderful presentation. I've been doing this whole time. Uh, I, I want to actually zero in on uh, the point that Michael ended with about uh, context-based versus privacy-based because I'm really sympathetic to that, and I guess. Can you help us imagine a little more of what some context-based approaches to um, research might, might look like? Uh, sure, and I'm sure others can, can jump in as well. Um, so I, I, I grew up academically um, under the frame of contextual integrity as a way to conceive of privacy and, and when we need to be respectful of, of people's uh, expectations. Um, and so I'm trying to find a way to apply that within research ethics space. And um, like for example, in the, the, the example of OkCupid that I gave, um, it's more a question of what was the uh, conditions under which users were sharing this data with this community and what were their expected um, audience, what were the transmission principles in terms of how this information would flow within this context, and what was the ultimate goal of sharing that information? What was the value they were trying to support? And there it was to find the partner. Um, and, and even though the information was quasi-public, it wasn't, you had to create an account to see the information. Um, the, the actions that he was taking was disrupting those norms, and therefore he would say the context under which those were 
um, uh, initially put forward uh, uh, was, was violated. It was being moved into a different direction. And that's what throws up the red flag to say that, wait, we need to stop at least think about this a little bit more um, and not just say carte blanche that it's public, therefore anything goes. Um, so, so, so trying to sort of uh, you know, look at it in, in those kinds of ways. But I don't know if anyone else has other are, examples. Are you, fa are you familiar <coughs> with the um, uh, New York City taxi data set? No. <laughs> we get a yes is no. Okay. Yes. I, oh, well, I'm going to explain anyway, so I don't know why I ask. Are you familiar with it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, there, uh, the New York City Taxi Commission had a complete set of all rides for like five years, and it was FOIA'd um, by so uh, the Freedom of Information Act. So somebody said, uh, "You're a public agency. Um, this data belongs to the public. Give it to us." Um, and so, and a court said, "Yeah, you have to give it to them." Um, and so it's ostensibly for transportation research, right? Because that if, if you know where all the taxis are needed and you know where, um, you know, everybody from, everybody uh, from um, 6th Avenue and uh, 6th and 20th um, at 6 p.m. is looking for taxis, so we need to build more bike lanes there. Or we need to, um, you know, give alternative forms of transportation for that group of people. That's actually really useful. That's what the data should be used for. Um, but it turns out that the agency didn't hash the data very well, and within hours of releasing this data set, um, people were figuring out which cab drivers were Muslim, because you could see when they took breaks. Within a day, they had identified an individual um, by name who took a taxi every night home, uh, took a taxi home every night from a strip club at the same time. There was, there was a ride that went from the strip club to a, to a particular house where only one person lived, Every night at you know 1:55 a.m., um, and then they uh, were able to de-identify the um, medallion numbers and figure out actually how much each taxi driver made and their annual income. So the data was there for one con for one context, which was um, regulators need to know this kind of stuff in order to make sure that the economy works correctly, and then it moved to another context which was um, uh, transportation researchers wanted to understand how humans move within a city. And then it moved to another context, which was um, uh, random strangers on the internet get to know your religion and how much you made last year. So if we say that public and private are binary, so either this, if this data is public, you can do whatever you want with it. If it's private, you can't do anything with it. Um, that actually doesn't help us understand what went wrong there. But if we think about it as we jumped contexts where the data was used for different purposes, then you can see how um, the, the, the norms and expectations of what this data means um, gets altered and sort of this, with sort of this rupture that um, feels like a violation to the people who are now being surveilled um, just because they drove a taxi. Yeah, I, the way that I, that I think about this is, is the, <coughs> if, if we use this if it's if it's public, you can do whatever you want. If it's private, you can't. The idea that like a tweet about the latest episode of Westworld is ex should be treated exactly the same as a tweet about a sensitive medical condition or a tweet with someone's phone number in it. Like the idea that those things are always exactly the same and you don't have to think about. Um, how you're using how you're using them differently that you get then you get this like but the data is public that is the answer to everything um, I just think that's a that's a fundamental mistake and yet that's what we're seeing most often in terms of how someone's making a judgment is devoid of any context and, and one thing just to keep in mind with this is how this abounds theory of contextual integrity that I'm invoking at least that just because there's this violation of context doesn't automatically shut down what's happening. Um, but it's the kind of thing that at least needs to be going to a second level of, of decision making and analysis to decide. Because the theory is inherently conservative in its, in its approach. It wants to protect what is you know, the standard norms of transmission and the standard norms of appropriate information. Um, but at, at the least it now creates this new avenue for us to, to throw up a red flag to say now we need to deliberate a little bit more on whether or not this potential violation might be okay, and, and perhaps it would be, but we at least not have to stop and, and talk about it. Right, so in the taxi case, I would say, well, yeah, it's wonderful to do the transportation research, even though it's a change of context. But 
a researcher should not be engaged in, sur in surveilling individuals according to their religion from this other context, right? So it's, um, it's as a community, we need to figure out how we hold each other responsible and what our expectations are. Um, and it's not to say that you shouldn't ever study someone's religion with data. It's that it should come from the right context and people should have some sense of autonomy over how their data is used. So I, I just want to be clear. Um, I love the part where you're breaking apart that binary and saying this binary is very problematic between the public and the private. I'm, I guess, looking for more practical approaches towards getting to that second step of how context works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is that, that seems to be the really hard part of that. that That's what we're trying that to is do. Yeah. Yeah. That is yeah. hard. <laughs> and what we're also recognizing quickly is that, A, defining a context is hard. Yeah. Check uh, back in a, you know, three yeah. to four years. <laughs> <laughs> because like the, the, the work that that we're doing on Fitbits, and you think about, well, Fitbit data as a context. I'm not sure, I'm collecting Fitbit data for the purpose of you know, enhancing my health. But when we start asking people about the different ways that data might flow <coughs> to the different people that might flow, we under, suddenly understand there's a whole bunch of subcontexts within this context. And so it, it gets messy, and it's not, it's, it's not gonna be a perfect approach. I can, I can acknowledge that, but uh, I appreciate your, your push on that. And I'll, I'll also add that I, as part of this, and kind of what we're thinking as well, is. I don't think any of us think that this is possible to do, at least not easily in the current IRB context, that there are structural issues there that make that a really difficult question. But if we do treat this as more of a speculative design exercise and step back and say, how do we design a system that helps us encourage and learn to do more ethical research? without necessarily thinking that the IRB is the answer. And this is, again, long-term kind of, you know, thinking, future thinking, but that's one of the questions we're really interested in, is what would a system look like that helps us do this in a way that gets us to that goal without not necessarily saying that the IRB is the right institution to do that. Uh, one more question? Do we have time? Yeah, sure. It's really yeah. fast. Uh, just when you say the difficulty in, like, creating tangible context or like the rules the, uh, that bring up context for these sort of things. I know you have a lawyer on your team, like the person that comes to my head is like that's the way that law is produced, like the, the methodology of law creates kind of the barriers of context. So I was wondering how much are you like in will be contact with like things like privacy law that like that build the foundation of like hey this is context where this is okay and not okay in, in integrating your kind of research going forward. Um I I think that even the law isn't very good at it sometimes. I mean, I get, I get what you're saying, that's, and that's a good point. I think that's the kind of thing we're, we're doing. But um, honestly, especially... Privacy law is a mess. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Privacy law is a mess, too. I mean, law's not good at creating models to, yeah. to go after. They're, they're good at creating, here is this set of facts, and now this rule applies to just this set. But you can't extrapolate from that. Yeah, like that's, that's what researchers need is the ability to, yeah. to, to talk broadly. Yeah, so. not that. Yeah, yeah. It's a weird space, and I think we're going to see a lot of in the next as the GDPR comes into effect and stuff. It's going to be, it'll be an interesting experiment yeah. I mean, in a legal framework. This is yeah. the European model the, that's coming into effect around privacy. The European, the Europeanization, the Europeanization, yeah. the, the influence of European law <laughs> in the privacy space is helpful because it does put more emphasis on. Um, on the person's um, expectations of that data, and that any secondary use, any use outside the original reason that data is collected needs to be, you need to go back and get consent again, um, which is closer to the kind of model that I, you know, ask for in terms of in terms of privacy regulation. Europe, I mean, for uh, those who aren't aware, European and American privacy laws are very different. It's utilitarian and deontological. Yeah. <laughs> Europeans so, focus much more on individual rights. And, 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 and dignity. Yeah. 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 All right, um, I think we should thank our panel and go downstairs. So thank you very much.